Welcome everyone. This is your host Juan Soto, and this is our first um, session back from our long recess, summer recess. Our last session was in uh, May, so we took June and July off in August, and now we're back to start a brand new season of Access with SQL Server. So uh, super excited to be here. Uh, can you guys confirm you can see my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you. As always, we uh, got a lot wide range of participants from people all over the world. So far, we got seven people. Welcome, everyone. And uh, I will be consulting the chat window. So if you have a question, you can put it in the chat window. And uh, let me put that over to the side here. So um, now let's go ahead and start with some news uh, regarding at Microsoft Access. As you know, we have a new program manager. And this is a little scrolling in the bottom with the text. Not sure if I can move that out of the way. Let's see. Yeah, I think there it is. Okay, new program manager. And uh, emphasis uh, right now with the Access team is they're doing a lot of great work, work with uh, integration with Dataverse. Now, if you don't know what Dataverse is, but you do know what Microsoft Teams are or Power Apps, all that technology, all the infrastructure of Teams and Power Apps, when you create a Power App, data is stored in Dataverse. And Dataverse is much more than just a SQL database. And before it was called Dataverse, it was called something database. I can't remember now it was. Uh, now they moved it over to the name Trademark Dataverse. And what it is, it's not just an Azure SQL Service, but rather a complete platform that allows you to scale your apps. So let's say, for example, you work at a uh, thousand person, thousand employee company to create this wonderful app that can be used by 500 employees. Well, in the old days, when you wanted to roll that out, you had to uh, spin up web servers, then you had to spin up load balancers, then you had to spin up uh, SQL databases. And then, you, I mean, it just, the infrastructure just kept growing and growing. And the more people like, you know, if you go to 10,000 people and 50,000 people, and you know, if you have all those simultaneous sessions, it's just, became a huge hassle. Well, with Dataverse, all that goes away and uh, Microsoft manages all for you. So you can focus on what's important with the, the, uh, the app itself. So uh, the team is working really heavily on that. I'm hoping that we will have an update from them later on this year. Um, we may have some updates early next year with um, SQL Monaco. SQL Monaco is an upgrade that I'm looking forward to where you can actually use uh, create uh, SQL statements in your code and have IntelliSense. So for example, if I say select um, from TVL customer, then I, come, I backtrack and put my cursor after the select and then put in uh, customer dot, customer ID, comma, right? And put customer, TVL customer dot, and then all the fields show, just like you do with SQL Server Manager 2. At least those are my expectations. Uh, and there's some other stuff that uh, is coming on the pike. If you do want to see what the team is working on, go check it out at the Microsoft Access Roadmap. So just look it up on the web, Microsoft Access Roadmap, and you can see what I, I've talked about that before in the past. Great page to, to keep your eye on if you want to see what's the latest and greatest Microsoft Access. I had a great summer. Lots of things happening with just, uh, not just on my personal life, but also with the firm and the Azure3groups.org organization. We, uh, you know, we launched a hugely successful new group out in uh, West Coast called Access Pacific. We got Access Eastern, which is headed up by Dave. And then we got the Access Pacific, which headed up by George. And then we got Access One Chime, which is headed up by Maria. I head up SQL Store with Access, Access in America, and Access Espana. I'm still looking to open additional chapters around the world, especially in other languages. So if you know anybody interested in uh, opening up a French chapter, Portuguese chapter, uh, Chinese chapter, Japanese chapter, please hit them up and let them know that I'm looking for somebody leaders in this space to uh, do more, more, more groups. But the Pacific chapter launched. George Hepworth, who was a former MVP, is not heading that up. It's doing a bang up job. So I do encourage you to uh, head over to accessusergroups.org and check out the schedule and participate in his. Um, and just all the other great meetings, a lot of great uh, topics. Maria Barnes, who heads up uh, Access Lunchtime, is doing a bang up job. And uh, we're working on new websites. As you know, the logo that we currently have, unfortunately, it looks like the COVID virus. So uh, that's not a lot of fun, as you can imagine. So we got a new logo coming. 
And you're probably starting seeing it now because Crystal Wong, who's an access MVP and is our official uh, video editor, if you watch videos that have recently been uploaded to the YouTube channel, to see uh, our new logo. So uh, be on the lookout for our new ramp, revamp websites. And then, um, and also the, don't forget that we have this wonderful tool that converts your access SQL to SQL, which we're gonna be discussing in either next month, uh, part two of uh, Access uh, Academy uh, with SQL Server Academy or part three, uh, which is the third month. Or, and I believe this year we're gonna have four parts. So that's an extraordinary four part series that I hope you can join me throughout this journey. And if you know people who uh, would like to learn more about Access with SQL Server, and uh, maybe they bypassed the first session, which is tonight, which is the introduction. Please have them come back for uh, next month and uh, we'll start getting more into the thick of things. I got homework assignment for you guys to follow uh, towards the end of the presentation. And uh, yeah, it's going to be great. Uh, on a personal level, uh, my wife retired last January from the uh, Chicago Teachers Union and uh, she joined my firm as a global HR director. And, um, she got a ton of money because she saved up her sick days uh, over many years of being a teacher and working at the union. So, use that money to use that money to buy a home in the Caribbean. So, we're going to be snowbirds going down to, to the Caribbean, uh, and I can, uh, I'll be uh, avoiding these Chicago winters, which are just uh, terrible. At least for me, they are. Right? It's, it's all fun and games in November for Thanksgiving and Christmas, but once you get to February, man, it's, it's rough. It's rough. So looking forward to to doing that. All right. Now, big shout out to Miguel and Wendy for joining us tonight. And let's go ahead and get started. I am going to advance my slide back here. Let's see if it will slide up automatically. Good one more time. Okay. All right. So I'm, uh, as you know, one so I'm the uh, founder of AccessGroups.org. Uh, I have a blog that talks a lot about SQL Server at accessexperts.com slash blog. Um, visited by a thousand people a day. I'm an access number of people, only 17 in the world. I own a firm, IT Impact in Chicago. We're a Microsoft Gold partner and uh, one of the few partners, if not the only partner, focuses on Microsoft Access with SQL Azure and SQL Server. And I always want to start with, I'm not an Excel, I'm not a SQL Server ex expert, I'm not an Excel expert either, but I'm not a SQL Server expert. What I am is I'm an expert on access with SQL Server and how to optimize that relationship between the two technologies. So uh, this is my contact info information. Please follow me on uh, Twitter, jsoto22. We have a you have a LinkedIn profile there. It's just real easy to follow LinkedIn.com slash in slash Monsoto. Please connect with me. And then of course we got the uh, access with SQL Server group there that uh, well, I urge you to join and we post uh, articles and tips there on a regular basis. All right, so if you're here, it's because you wanna learn how to uh, grab this bull by the horns and use SQL Server. And I'm glad you are because this is how I earn my living. I, you know, of course, when uh, all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail, but in this case, uh, I think SQL Server and SQL Server Express in particular, it's just a wonderful thing. It's the best thing that we're having to access. Um, and what it is, when you migrate your data to a SQL Server backend, you really achieve some wonderful benefits, speed of use, stability. I mean, raise your hand if you ever had a situation when you only had a Microsoft Access database and it crashes on you and you, you lose data or um, you see Chinese characters when you bring it back up or you need to compact repair. It's just a never ending. Also, when you add more and more people to a regular access database, right? So if you have a situation where, for example, when I get a call from a potential customer and they tell me, I ask them, many users are on the database? Well, we got three, sometimes four, because you know what, you really need SQL Server Express, uh, which is free from Microsoft. Or uh, you've got, um, uh, you know, we can not, like for example, an expert like ourselves, we can put 25 people on us, access only database. Right, we know all the pitfalls, we know the issues, and we can get you up to 25, but usually what happens is um, I would uh, I would actually automatically just migrate them over to SQL Server when they have more than three, three and ten, about three, it depends on their usage and the network traffic, I'll just upgrade them to. Or they want to go to Azure and the cloud. We're going to be talking about that later on in this series, especially uh, next month or the third month on how to migrate your data to the cloud and what's the drawbacks and the pitfalls you need to avoid doing that. 
Now, another reason, now you can have just one person, um, uh, one person using a database that if they're storing confidential information, such as HIPAA, credit card numbers, social security information, right? They really need to use SQL Server. They just need to. Right? And I take that very seriously. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I walk into a potential customer and they've got uh, credit card data in the database, or they've got the social security number of the employee. And I tell them, look, you know, it's very easy to copy this database and access to a USB drive and walk out the door with it. Now, there's a term hackers use for that kind of situation called a honeypot. Because they're like bees, right, to the honey. And so you want to uh, avoid being a honeypot and having uh, hackers come in through their firewall from Comcast. Because <laughs> a lot of times I'll walk in and they have, I'll ask them, okay, what kind of firewall do you have? And, um, oh, you know, we, we got a firewall. Yeah, so, okay, which one do you have? Well, we got the one that, that came with Comcast. You mean that Comcast modem that is used by millions of businesses around the U.S. that's all, you know, all the vulnerabilities I know about it, and that's the firewall you're using? So, you know, it's, um, it's a conversation that's sometimes tough to have, but we need to have it with our potential clients, right? So by moving that data over to SQL Server or SQL Server Express, you secure that data. You want to make it harder for the uh, for that data to get compromised. Right now, I'll be the first one to tell you that if somebody really wants your data and they know great things about how to tackle SQL Server and uh, network security and bypassing Comcast firewalls. Probably, you know, and they really want it, then, you know, it's, it's the only thing you need to do is be right once and go right with data. You have to be right every day, right? So you have to secure your environment every day. But just by the act of moving that confidential data to SQL Server and then encrypting uh, columns, which I believe we'll be talking about the fourth month from now. So, um, or part four, we're going to talk about uh, encrypting columns and how to decrypt that uh, to authorized user. Just by doing that, you're already uh, uh, much more secure than just using an access database, right? So security data is another reason why you want to do it. Many, many more years. I've had systems that uh, use 100 people and they would access a SQL Server, right? 150 people, not a problem, right? And now, of course, when you get to that many people, it's really hard to do that with just SQL Server Express, right? At that point, they're using SQL Server Standard or Enterprise and, um, but yeah, you can use, you can service a lot of employees at the same time, employees that are going remote. Uh, as you can imagine, the pandemic has introduced a lot of people working from home. So one uh, one of the things that we've been getting during the pandemic is, hey, you know, we went to uh, work from home and we realized the access database all by itself is just super slow. And I have a blog post on this. You can search VPN on my website, accessexpose.com, that's blog. And uh, I specifically say, look, Access was never designed to work with VPN, right? It's a file share system. It's not a true server system. And so you, when we have SQL Server, it's going to avoid that issue and then you have better performance. And then we have a process, we call it web enable access. I think I'll double quote web enable access. And really what it is, we moved to do that to Azure and now you're using access natively in the desktop and, uh, and then uh, using the data on Azure. There's been some new technology introduced by Microsoft. We'll be talking later on in the academy uh, called Windows 365. So we'll be talking about how that implication, implication affects uh, moving your data to the cloud. All right, next slide. Uh, Dan, you got, uh, you're asking me about the uh, SQL Server group and LinkedIn. Yeah, if you do uh, if you do a search on SQL Server with access group and LinkedIn, you should get it, but I'll get you the, the link around uh, in, the, in the evening. All right, thanks for the question, Dan, by the way. So again, if you have any questions, we have the chat open. All right, so look, um, I'll be the first one to tell you that just migrating your data to SQL Server is not the panacea. I could mispronounce that, sorry. That people think it is, right? Uh, they have some, their common misconception is, oh, I'll just migrate the data to SQL Server and everything will speed up and I won't have any issues. Well, no, sometimes things will actually slow down. Sometimes things can actually get worse 
when you do that, we'll be going into more details on why they did worse in probably next slide here. Now, SSMA, a sequence of migration assistant, we'll be talking about that next month. I'm going to ask you as part of your homework, you can be installing SSMA on your home PCs or work PCs, this is what work. And, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we're going to end up with great performance solution. The heavens will open up, the rays will fall. I mean, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you're ready to tackle world hunger after you upgrade to a single source. And, you know, sometimes it's a real letdown when you realize it's actually slower. And that's when uh, you really need to pay attention as to why it's slower. We're talking about those reasons how to, how to solve them. I get this question a lot. Like I had a question, I was I was at a client's site today this this uh, this week actually, and the clients okay, what version of Secret Service are you using? You know, it depends on obviously if you got ten users or hundred users. If it's a high transaction uh, environment, right? If you got if you're if you're I'm not saying you're gonna be Amazon with a thousand transactions a second, but you have a lot of transactions occurring. Uh, you're receiving data, for example, for multiple pieces of equipment, and you've got a hundred pieces of equipment. And they're all seeing your data on a constant basis. Every second you're getting transactions. I mean, that's a high value transaction environment. You may want to go with SQL Server Enterprise. Other than that, SQL Server standard is fine. And honestly, if you have a five person um, low transaction database, a SQL Server Express is fine. Look, I installed hundreds of SQL Server Express installations over the years, hundreds, right? And I've been doing this for many years that care to say, at, uh, and um, do you know how many of my clients have gone beyond SQL Server Express and purchased the standard version of Intel SQL Server, a standard version of the price? I can count them all on one hand, right? So SQL Server Express, it's the nature of the business, right? If they're calling me to upgrade them to, to SQL Server, it's because it's already, already a small, low volume transaction system, right? If they're calling me because they already have SQL Server installed, and it's probably because they realize they have a lot more users and that's a separate situation. But sometimes, most of the times we get the calls are people have an Excel um, system that's grown, they've grown out of Excel, they got frustrated with Excel, they're ready to migrate to the server or they have a pure access database and they're just ready to go to SQL Server Express. So if your uh, business or if your company is thinking about making this jump to SQL Server, you haven't purchased SQL Server yet, you have a very small, low transaction database, which is probably the definition of Microsoft Access database. Probably, but we will probably find with SQL Server Express, right? Now, installing SQL Server is just half the coin. The other half the coin is SQL Server Management Studio SSMS, which you're also you're going to be installing uh, for month two as part of your homework. And we always advocate that you use the latest drivers. We'll be talking more about this here on the course. Uh, but the latest drivers, for those who need to know, is first nugget of the night OLADB driver 17 for SQL Server and OLADB, that's a misspelling, it's not low, the OLADB is OLADB driver for uh, 18 for SQL Server. And the reason I put their ADODB list is um, a couple of years, year and a half back, we actually, um, uh, the Microsoft side and their infinite wisdom, we're not going to do AD volume, ADODB no more, and the uproar was deafening. Would be after reverse course, and then realize that a lot of people still use ADODB. And it's actually the preferred layer to interact with SQL Server. We'll be talking about that in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, these are the two drivers, right? So the first nugget of the night, ODBC driver, 17 for SQL Server, MS OLADB, or right here in the chat, MS OLADB, or SQL Server 18. And of course, SSMA is what we're going to be using uh, next month as part of the homework to migrate to access for sure. By the way, if you guys still have a show of hands in the chat, how many of you guys are interested in uh, first timers with uh, access to SQL Server? So if you have, just say me in the chat, uh, I'm first time with, or never, never used SQL Server with access, I'd like to know who has never used SQL Server access, let us know in the chat there. That'd be a great, quick survey there. Thank you, Klaus. Klaus from uh, Germany, always a fan of the of the chat of the group. Uh, I know it's like three in the morning in Germany, so thank you, Klaus, for joining us for the point. You have to use if you're using 20, if you're 2019, you have to use the new drivers. Otherwise, it won't work. All right, Dan, you're first timer. Thank you. 
Wendy, first project. Thank you very much. And Dominic, all right. Good. All right. Now, limitation of SQL Server Express. This is important that we talk about this, and we, I'll, I'll make my point at the end, is uh, you only have loading data to hard drive space. Now, I've had people, I've upsized people, right? Now, as many of you may, may or may not know, there's a hard limit to Microsoft Access database. That's two gigabytes in a file, right? As you approach that, that event horizon, the two gigabytes is going to get slower, more unresponsive, more frustrating. So it's going to, and once you get the two gigabytes, it just locks up. It just stops the fun. But when you upload those two, gigab two gigabytes to your SQL Server Express, you're thinking, okay, I just lost two gigs of SQL Server Express. Now we have uh, 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 nine gigs left. That's not the case. SQL Server technology is a lot better in compressing hard that uh, access database so that you'll end up with maybe a 500 uh, megabyte uh, Microsoft SQL Server uh, database, right? So don't think that's a one-to-one -one ratio, ratio. It's not. Uh, SQL Server is much better, and it's a server product, and Microsoft put a lot of effort in hard drive optimization. Now, if you put SQL Server Express, you can actually put this, install this, on your PC, uh, and that works fine. I've done I've done peer to peer networking on Express with PC, but if that PC has eight gigs of RAM, it's always one gig of RAM. If it's got a uh, twelve core processor, it's going to use one core, uh, one stock of the four core, which is less. Uh, and um, you know, and if you upgrade the SQL Server Express and you did your beta environment and you realize it's still too slow, even after following my recommendations, optimization, you may need to buy the standard version, right? Now, Microsoft is not done, right? They give you Express, but they, they, they you know, it's Express with one arm tied to hands back. They want you to buy standard. But like I said, a lot of times, 90% of the times, this is getting away with Express, it's fine. Anything you use from Express, the standard enterprise that's going to run circles around access, right? I always make the analogy access is a bicycle, you upgrade to a car. All right, so this is the second nugget for tonight. Before you go down this road, SQL Server Express, you've got to resolve these issues with access. And I'll tell you why. This is why people get frustrated when they do upgrade and it's this slower in SQL Server than it was with access, right? It gives you one. You told me it was going to be faster and it was going to be more stable, and I upgraded, and it's just, it was a disaster, especially if you upgrade the Azure. Right? I mean, that's even worse. If you don't know how to optimize access with SQL Server with Azure, which we'll be talking at month four for this academy, uh, it's never actually worse, right? So, this is one of the reasons. If your access database already has issues of slowness, you got to correct those issues. Now, analyze why you have issues with slowness of access. It could be lack of any forward index. It could be a lack of how many keys. I mean, I've seen people. No, access is very forgiving. I mean, God bless access. It's it's, it's so forgiving that somebody with zero database knowledge of theory of database or normalization techniques can create a mission critical application for the company. Right? Think about that. Somebody with zero database skills can take access, and they're so frustrated that they took access and they, they learned it by force, and they may not have learned it well, but they designed something and they they solved their they solved their issue and they're super happy with it, but it's slow, right? Solved it many things, but it's slow. It's unstable. It's slow. so there's there's a lot of reasons why your access database can be slow. It could be that your network has the issue, right? So if your network has this access, it's going to have access with SQL Server, right? So you want to make sure you have it's not, it's not a problem with that. It could be a lack of indexes. It could be your table design, lack of primary keys. Now, with access, you can create a table without primary keys, which you never should. But once you upgrade the SQL Server, third nugget of the night, once you upgrade the SQL Server, that table becomes read only. SQL Server. Access will think of that table as read only. It doesn't matter if it worked before in Access, but once you upload the data to SQL Server, and uh, it's read only. Right? So always in, always have, they're not going to always have primary keys on your tables and access database. All right. 
All right. So in the Klaus, uh, Klaus, if you haven't don't have the chat window open, folks, you might want to get some really good, really good uh, nuggets there. We're we'll talking about the view updatable issue probably next month, Klaus. But that you get the point. Now, um, I had a, a customer who told me about asking this question about SharePoint. You know what? Well, about SharePoint? Why don't they just use that? And the answer is you could. But I don't recommend it. You know, basically, SharePoint it is not a, a, a database system per se, right? It's a document or a document manager system. And in SharePoint, you're dealing with lists. And the performance is not as good, not as powerful as the store spreads. Used to be okay, but we no longer use SharePoint. So stay away from the SharePoint. This is another quick, quick great question. She said, What is DNS endless? Now, uh, I know some of you have never used Active SQL Server, but those of you who have know that uh, you have to create DSN, and we'll be creating DSN next month when we go to that second part of the academy uh, to access the um, tables of SQL Server. And DSN stands for Database Service Name, I think it is. Maybe Klaus, you know what the S stands for. I believe it's Database uh, Service Name. And uh, it's an old ODC technology go into your control panel and create the SN. Then that DSN is configured with the drivers and the information to connect the SQL Server. And again, we'll see this next month when we go to the second part. And then once you connect the SQL Server, now you have a DSN ready. Now you can use that with uh, Microsoft Access to so link your tables back to the front end. There are several issues with that. Number one is if you're not careful, it'll save your username and password in the DSN table, big tables, right? And so that's a big no no, big security call. Don't want to save uh, passwords and usernames, compromise the security. Instead, we want to use code uh, in your tables, and we might get that to uh, part two. Um, looks like I will get to chapter two with the system we'll do next month. This this first month, we're talking mostly talking. Next month, we're doing more action stuff. I'm glad you're here. And you can listen to me on my diatribes here. All right, the next step is DAO versus ADLDB. And the reason I bring this up early in this discussion is um, in order to really capitalize on SQL Server, you got to use ADLDB. ADLDB stands for, ADL stands for Active Data Objects. And what it is, it allows you to bypass uh, ODDC and DAL to go straight to the story from your code. And we'll be seeing that later on in the academy. Now, when you have a pure access system, you only use the DAL. You could use ADODB, it doesn't make sense. But when you have a pure access system using DAL, right? You have two files, a front end and back end, that is what I hope you do. Then you link your back end tables to front end. You're linking through DAO. And when you go to SQL Server, you're still using DAO for those table links. I want to be clear that doesn't go away. DAO doesn't go away once you've got the SQL Server. You're always going to have to use DAO at some point uh, in your access database. But with AODB, it really does um, turbocharge your environment, right? And I got a great example of that. So for example, you have a product table, 2 million rows. And management says, you know, we want to upgrade, uh, we want to update the pricing across the board 10%, right? So you probably have a column in that product table about pricing, or MSRP, whatever it is. You want to run a query against the 2 million rows where you say price equal to price times 1.10, right? 10% more. Well, if you don't use ADODB for that query, it's going to be a long time before you see the you see a confirmation message and access in SQL Server that says the operation is complete. I mean, it's just going to be dragging across the screen. It's like seeing grass grow. And if you're not careful, they'll time out. You'll actually, uh, it'll just give them back with a message, time out. And then you don't know if some of the rules got updated, some don't. It's a mess now because now you have some of them. Okay, there. And if you didn't back up before you did the price update, right? How do you know which ones got updated? So uh, it's a mess. Something like that, you will probably talk about this later on in month three or month four, but you want to wrap that in a transaction, a batch transaction process where 
it, uh, it updates all the roles, then you commit those transactions to the database, and now you're sure that's an all or nothing thing because you either update all your two million roles or you don't update them, but you don't want to end up with one million of them updating the other one not, right? So, anyway, but when you use the UDB and you send that uh, to uh, through AWDB, it's almost instantaneous. Right, so it just drags with SQL with Microsoft, but in mean, it's just one of the things. Why is that? Because with ADODB, you're telling the server, here, you do it. There's a SQL syntax, you take care of it. If you're using DAO on a regular SQL Server Access Database, it could be, right, it could be done by the server, or it could be the Access decides to take over and say, I'll do it. And if Access is doing it, it's going row by row. It's giving that query is doing a mass, it's supposed to do a mass update, SQL Server. And that brings me to my next point, and that is you want to leverage the power of SQL Server in this relationship, right? So you got access on one side in this relationship, you got SQL Server on the other. You need to add, leverage that muscle, that SQL Server muscle, right? And so we're going to be talking throughout the academy how to do that, how to optimize the relationship with those two. Uh, another kick I get is, when I get a custom call from people, says, "Hey, Juan, I've got three hundred thousand rows. I'm talking about millions of rows here. Right. I got three hundred thousand rows in a CSV file. I'm trying to upload my SQL Server as time you know. And I'll be the first one to tell you, it's not, it, that's just the worst good possible thing. It's just too much. It just takes too long for access to answer the CSV. You can take a CSV file, right? Now, usually, what you do there is you import that CSV file to an access database table." Really access table, and then you probably do an insert query from the access table onto the SQL Server table. Well, that's going to time out. Most it's I call those coffee break queries where you go take a coffee break, and then you go to the wild cooler, and then you go to a restaurant, then you go talk to Bill and the nice people go over, and then you come back, and maybe it's done or maybe it's timed out. So inserting a large amount of records, deleting a large amount. Of Updating alarm records, right? those are action queries. I just going to take too long. And there's techniques that we're going to be discussing how to avoid that uh, uh, later on in the for in the in the camp. So this is a, a good diagram. I actually um, I'm going to launch this URL and paste this URL into um, browser and they give you the actual URL. This is an article I helped write. I'm not part of this. Or is not credited with this article, but it did help the access team write it. Uh, and so there's a URL. And uh, deal was able to hide is this recommendation for all SQL or specific to SQL Azure? No, it's all SQL. You want to use the ADA for all SQL? Great question. Klaus says such a percentage should be done by SP. Absolutely. You can handle SP or you can handle it from the authorities. The way it's fine. All right, but this diagram tells you, right, what's happening here. You remember I told you first nugget, here's the ODBC 17. Well, that's over here on the left hand side. And then MSLA they'd be on the right hand side. That's that's the, those two drivers. The advantage of the OLADB provider is there's no interpretation of the SQL code. I'll explain to that for you. But you're gonna see this later on in the academy. If I do a um, if I do a query where I take the uh, my customer's first name and I put a space between it and then I take my customer's life name. So I say select, select first name, ampersand, space, ampersand, last name, as name, right? Or as customer name from TBL customer. Right? I'm using the ampersands and uh, I'm yeah, using that in an access because that's how you add up to fields. Well, when DAO, will then send that and convert that over to proper T-SQL, which is using the plus sign. So T-SQL instead of ampersand select, you're doing select first name plus space. And the spaces are surrounded by single quotes, not double quotes. And plus last name from TBO customer. But the, the dial and the ODBC driver is taking your access SQL it's shifting it and changing it to use T-SQL and then it's sending that T-SQL to the SQL Server because SQL Server has no idea about the SQL. SQL doesn't know what ampersand is. SQL Server doesn't know about what this uh, 
double quote space, double quote, that's a completely different meaning in SQL Server, right? So the ODBC driver, so this path on the left-hand side is always going to be, well, not always, but almost always slower than this path here because with ADL, you're actually sending a T-SQL to the server. So I'm actually saying select first name plus single quote, single quote space, single quote plus last name from TBL customer. The right-hand side doing that. So I'm interpreting that for the, there's no middleman that's interpreting that for me. And maybe this isn't interpreting my, my, T, my SQL, my SQL and sending who knows what to SQL server. Now I'll be the first one to tell you, the you know, see driver has gotten better and better over the years. This driver has done, that's been improved by leaps and bounds, right? And your performance may not differ much from idea. But a lot of times it will, if you're not, if you're depending on what kind of transaction, right? If you're doing update queries and so forth. So take a look at that uh, article from the Microsoft team, great article, how to use Axel SQL Server. And uh, I helped write it, so it's good. All right, next slide. We have the learning people. Welcome, everybody. I am going good. All right. All right. Now, in Access, let me take my drink here. All right, on that. So, in Access, they're called queries. In SQL Server, they're called views, right? In Access, they're called modules. In SQL Server, they're called stored procedures. So, if you ever done code in Access, you know code is stored in modules. Well, in SQL Server, they're called stored procedures. And the recipe is fairly straightforward. You're gonna offload as much work to SQL Server, right? Use that muscle. You're gonna become a SQL Server developer. That's the only way you're gonna become great optimizing the actual SQL Server. And trust me, it's not that hard. You're gonna love working with these tools next month that we're gonna be using SQL Server Management Studio. It's actually, uh, it's actually a wonderful experience. I found it really nice. And I thought it was uh, quite the moment in my career when I realized that uh, SQL Server's got the latest and greatest tools. I mean, think about Access VBA. It hasn't really changed much in the last 12 years, right? The last major change with VBA, Access VBA, and you may disagree with me on this, but the last major change that we have with Access was Templars, which has introduced a wonderful personality into Access. And if you've never used Templars, go look it up. But, um, but you know, let's face it. This is not Microsoft Focus, right? They consider they consider <laughs> consider access to be a mature product, right? Like uh, you know, I, I'll be the first one to tell you they have a lot more Excel and Word developers than they do access developers at Microsoft working on these products. But um, and that's just my own personal opinion. I don't know for sure, but I, I can wager a lot of money on that. But um, so, but you know, where's the focus these days? It's all about Azure, SQL Server, uh, Power Apps, Power Automate Desktop, PAD. If you don't, if you haven't played with that, please do. I mean, it's a huge activity improvement. Power Automate Desktop, and um, and you're going to be working with the latest technologies. That's why I say I feel that this is going to be a real eye opener for you. Those of you who have started working with uh, SQL Server and want to learn. You're gonna love this journey that we're gonna to take together through the next four months and learning these tools and learning how to really optimize it. And if you've used been using SQL Server for a while, you came here today thinking, okay, it's an interesting course while we show up anyway. I appreciate that. And I hope you work away with some nuggets. Come back next month where we start talking about more in depth about SQL Server and then the month three and month four. It used to be a three month course, now I'm gonna extend it to four months. And by the way, easier EDODB is a technology that I developed uh, for access. Um, and it is much easier to use EDODB. You're going to see that either the next month or the third month on how easy EDODB. But uh, if you can't wait, uh, please uh, look it up. If you are just type easy EDODB in one word and ask the Google to take you to my blog post on how to use that. All right, so the first step, right? You're ready to take charge ahead. I'm ready, Juan. Let's go. What's next? Well, the next step would be how to get your data into SQL Server, right? You have to migrate that data. Now, before 
before SSME, man, it was really hard to upload the data to your server. You have to create the tables. Then you have to create the data. Then you have to create the maps. Then you have to create the tables. There wasn't a tool that would create the data, create the tables, and put your data like it is with SQL SSMA. So uh, God bless this tool because it really has saved us hours in every project that we do. And we're going to be using this tool next month, so make sure you install this uh, before you come to SQL Server Academy Part View, uh, which we always meet the second Tuesday of the month. So wherever that second Tuesday is in October, we'll be meeting. Uh, and um, it creates indexes, it adds role version, it sets your bit default value zero. It, got, it takes care of a lot of gotchas and uh, takes care of a lot of things for you, the tool to be able to automate that. But what it really brings home the bacon is it helps you do a migration project, right? Um, so let's say, for example, I get a call from a customer. Actually, I'm actually going to be seeing a um, Health and advice manufacturer later on this week in Chicago. He emailed me say, I've got multiple access databases. I'm ready to take them to uh, SQL Server. Well, think about that. I show up, I, I make the sale, I can schedule them for November. I come in November, I grab their back ends, right? And now I upload them to the cloud. Well, I consider that the development environment. So I still have to modify their front ends to work with. The uh, SQL Server in the cloud, and uh, it's going to take me a while, right? And then I'll come up with a bigger version. I will then ask the client to give me his files again, right? Because I wanted to do beta testing, and they don't want to do beta testing with stale data. And it could be three, four weeks after I've uh, I grabbed that file the first time. So when I give them the data file, what is it going to do? They go to their current system, which is only access based. You know, look up an order and they want to see that same order with uh, Azure in the cloud and see how it reacts. Is it slow or is it faster? How is it reacting, right? And so you got to update the data. In SSMA, I'm telling you, it's just a breeze to upload the data for beta. And then the customer, um, we may have multiple beta rounds, right? It grabbed his files, and and uh, but then we're ready to roll out, right? So he says, Juan, this is great. They fix the bugs, ready to go live. And so we'll go live. We'll say, okay, maybe we'll go live Friday afternoon. And one last time, I use SQL Server Migration Assistant. And I'll be showing you this next month to update all that data with just a single click. It's just a really amazing tool. Now, thank you, Ross, for the link. If you're looking for the link for SSMA, it's version 8.22. Make sure you download that version because there's multiple versions in the file. So Ross has got you the latest version there. Where was I? I was going to make an important point. Darn it. I got distracted. This is why I have to start looking at the comments. Damn, that's why I go live. This is May. Okay, beta final rollout. Oh, oh yeah, I remember that. Uh, several years back, as part, of being, as part of being MVP, you get invited to Microsoft's headquarters every year. And you just have to pay for the Earthplay ticket, and they'll pay for your lodging. They whine at them dying. I mean, they really do appreciate us. Right? I got my MVP shirt here, and I've got my beautiful awards. I was hoping to show you my 10 year disc. I'm a, uh, this year, I've been 10 years as an MVP. But we have sessions where we go. I call it visiting the mothership to re refresh my batteries. And during the, those three days that we're on strike, we go to the different sessions. One of the sessions that we got several years ago was the actual program manager. For SSMA, he came over to talk to us, right? And uh, these guys slide that. And he says, okay, we have SQL Server Migration System for Oracle. We have it for Excel. We have it for SAP. Of course, well, Microsoft wants these companies to abandon those platforms, come to them, right? Come to SQL Server. So they, they create these tools. And we have one for some Microsoft Access, as you know. Well, it turns out, that the number one SQL Server Migration Assistant, the one that gets used the most worldwide, and they know this because they gather statistics. Every time you say yes, I'll send my data, I'm not going to say that at Microsoft, they're getting a ton of statistics from you, a ton. I'm telling you, trust me when I say this. There's a lot of data coming from your PC to Microsoft anonymously. It's Microsoft Access. Number one in the world, bar none. 
So there's more people moving data from Access. Now think about that. Then Excel, Oracle, SAP, MySQL, every every other one. Just a great. Uh, you know, when he said that, my chest just inflated, and I felt like I was a cloud nine. So, so uh, wonderful statistic there. All right, we talked some about some of these, right? Uh, tables, window, index, no foreign keys. Now, to be honest, Access is really good at playing, doing foreign keys because if you uh, if you ever if you ever let's say for example you have a customer table, right? Customer table might have a uh, primary key customer ID, which is an auto number table, number auto number field. Then you have an order table. Well, the order table has a uh, has a um, primary key order ID, but it also has another field called customer ID. So customer ID is the foreign key that's a primary key on the customer table. You follow what I'm saying? Well, when you go into access, you design those tables. Like you start with customer customer table, you create the customer table, save the grade, how you create your order table. When you type in customer ID as a second field and the order ID in the order table, Access automatically adds an index to that order table for you. Anything that ends with the letters ID, so uh, order ID, uh, order line item ID, uh, vendor ID, anything that's not a primary key that you put ID at the end is going to end up with a front of an index and your access table, which is, that's the way it should be, right? Because you're going to be doing queries on these foreign keys. You're going to link the customer table, customer ID with the customer ID in the order table and create a query to those two tables. That's just something that's going to speed up that query tremendously. If you didn't have an uh, index on your foreign keys, it would be a lot slower if you are always saving. If you have hardly no data, you won't, you won't see the impact. But as you as that database gets used over the years, more and more records get added, yeah, it's going to speed up having those keys, right? Now, SQL Server doesn't do that. Let me say all of that. SQL Server will not create an index for you on your foreign keys. That's up to you. However, if you already have them in Access, SSMA will create those index for you in SQL Server. But once you've created your SQL Server database, like once you go live with uh, with your access with SQL Server database, and then later on you create a new table and it's got a primary key and foreign keys, you have to create those indexes yourself, right? So keep that nugget number four. I'm like, I think I'm up to the four nuggets now, right? With, uh, with number nugget number four. All right. Hi, George. George had four from uh, access specific. Welcome, welcome, my friend. Thank you for joining us here. So, any questions regarding access specific, please let me put in the chat. They just made a great suggestion. And then um, here's a big one for me. I, mean, I can't tell you how many times I walked into a customer, right? Sit down with them, got their foreign keys. I mean, the primary keys. And it's not a sequential number. Right? I mean, that's the idea. You want, first of all, you want to be a number. Why do you want it to be a number, right? Because if you have a string, that's more, it takes up more space in a hard drive. And it's a lot harder to, and that's a string field that is to create a number field because it's string. There's a possible combination of characters and numbers. Sometimes I'll sit down with a customer and I'll look at their order ID primary key and it's a complex primary key. What does that mean? You'll see something like uh, month, this is month nine, that's September, right? 2021. So what they'll have is their primary key is 2021's four digits of the year, and then followed by the two digit month zero nine, and then followed by the date of the order, which is the 14th, and then it was building B and uh, um, company unit four. And, you know, it's just like a complex primary key that means a lot to them. God bless them, right? They, they want to be able to look at that primary key and say, oh, yeah, that was done in 2021. At that day, that time was just. It was done by this or that, but those are the worst, especially if they got characters in them. So usually what I end up doing is I let them have their little primary key in SQL Server, but I actually make it that a secondary field and they actually have a true auto number that's hidden from them and access that I maintain separately 
And so, and I tell them this, I'm not hiding it from them, right? Well, they, they ask me, I always try to be truthful. I always try to be truthful because, you know, it's kind of lying to people, or it'll catch up with you. But I tell them, look, you know, primary complex, primary key, I understand why you did it. And I understand they have a lot of information, but it's not ideal. We need to go to SQL trauma members. I try to talk them out of it. And if I can't talk them out of it, then eventually what happen is, I'll keep it and then I'll just add my own primary key and sequence. So I, I really put my foot down on that. So no, we gotta have we gotta have that there. And then poorly designed queries, right? Here's the thing about why people have speed issues with queries, and that is they 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 here's what here's my philosophy regarding queries. Number one. When you design a complex query, right, if I give a complex query to four access professionals, we'll probably end up with four different designs, right? There could be a variation of designs like first. So queries are not an exact science. That's number one. Number two, you and I can come up with a design for a query and still obtain the same results, right? So the queries are not an exact science and they can be done differently. But when you have a poorly designed query, such as a query that uses a function, right? So I've got this query in access, and uh, uh, there's a function I'm using as the criteria value in one of the fields. But that's not going to work in SQL Server. And if you try to have SSM make them work that query into view, it's going to fail. It'll actually tell you you can't do it because you're using a function. You want to avoid that. Why? Because every time you execute a query with a function, the criteria in the field, it's got to open that bunch and run through the code and come back to the results. If you got a hundred thousand row query, it's a hundred thousand times it's just giving that function, right? It's just not worth it. We need to come up with an alternate means. Maybe we create a secondary table, a tertiary table, where we have values that simulate the function and we link to that table. And then before we run the, run the query, we then populate those tertiary tables with the values we want to query against, right? But you want to avoid poorly designed queries because it really is going to drag your SQL Server database. All right. Now, I used to teach Microsoft Access courses back in the day out here. And um, one of the things I always tell my students is know the answer before you ask the question. Right. And that is, um, you got to be able to validate your queries, right? And so, and these, especially when you've got reports based on queries, right? Think about reports for a second. They're, 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 you've got all this great data in your database, and you use reports to get value out of it. Now, our motto here, our trademark in IT Impact, is we help you discover the power of your data. Well, that's how, that's how the power, you discover the power of your data through reports. That's one way to discover the power of your data. If you're going to get these reports to management, they gotta be accurate because if they're not accurate, what's gonna happen? You're gonna lose credibility. And more importantly, your database is gonna lose credibility with the management team. And that's the last thing you want. You want your users to be confident that the reports they're getting are accurate, right? And because reports are almost always based on queries, that means you have to make sure your queries are correct. And how do you validate that? Well, I always ask my employees to export the data to Excel and have a secondary check. On the query. Now, admittedly, if you have a very simple query, you know, it's like starting from TBL customer where state equal Illinois, we don't need to do that, right? Because basically, we uh, filter the table for Illinois and we came up with, for example, three other records, and the query comes back with three other records, we're done. But when you have a complex query that you don't know for sure that the right results are correct, and you should always validate your queries, right? Everybody validates their queries. Before they use in production, well, you gotta take that data. The way I do it is I export to Excel. And then I come up with an alternate means to validate that query. So that when I base that query on a report, I can almost guarantee the management is accurate. Now, you know, have I failed? Yes, I failed. But I've made, you know, I've made that my rule over the years that served me well. But it should serve you well too. So know the answer before you ask the question, right? The question is queries. Answer the result of the query, right? Boys and kids, always uh, check for the uh, 
going to be answered for you in queries. All right, so I'm going to open up for questions today. Wow, this was a short meeting. Well, not really. Uh, now it's the question and answer time. What do you guys think about the uh, of our first night here? And so, which types of sequels do you like it? You can open up your mics or you can type in the, in the chat. Give me some feedback. Did you like what you're hearing? Dan says, great. Thank you, Dan. Who was Any good feedback for me? I mean, I'm, I'm open to criticism, so let me know. I try and make these entertaining, right? Because think about it. You have, many of you already had dinner. You probably come, come we have a comma, comatose dinner, right? Carb, carb, comatose. And so I'm trying to make this entertaining. I throw in some anecdotes. I throw in some suggestions. A lot of experience. Does anybody have a question about the uh, actual SQL Server? Or a question regarding SQL Server? All right. So good. Here's what we're going to do next month. Now, next month is we're going to meet on what day? So let me take a look at October. Next month, the second Tuesday of October is October 12th. So we're going to come back. You're going to come back here Tuesday, October 12th, and you're going to be spelling. So do screenshots of this. Right? You're going to be spelling. Now, Claus got you the link for SSMA. You want to install the developer edition of SQL Server, not the Express, the developer edition. Right? So you want to go in, you want to go to uh, download, you want to download developer edition SQL Server. And the only catch is the only one user at a time can be connected. But since we're going to be only one user, you doing this academy it should be fine. Then you're going to install SQL Server Management Studio, which is used to be installed with SQL Server 9 anymore. And then you're going to install SQL Server Migration Super Access. And then we're going to, for next month, we're going to actually convert the NoFwin database to SQL Server. It's going to be a lot of fun. Okay, then to the access to SQL Server connection. So we just goes and gave up on the installation of SQL Server. It was a disaster right here. So another time. Yeah, absolutely, man. You'll love it. I just actually got a laptop and installed SQL Server developer edition. That was a breeze. All right. So next month, that's what I do. Now month three is November. And I, I need to take a look at month three because I'm actually taking my management team to uh, Costa Rica the first week of November. Another advantage of working for IT and Web, right? You get to go to <laughs> exotic locations once a year. I'm taking my management team to Costa Rica uh, first week of November. So I'll be back in time, November 9th. So I'll be talking to you guys. Maybe I'll show you, I maybe I'll show you when uh, I show you how to some photos of my trip there. So month two, month two in November is November that the third time we're gonna meet Tipo Server Academy number three is to be seven fourteen. And uh, and then the fifth, the fourth time is gonna be January eleventh. So I'm hoping you guys can make it all those all those months, right? And we'll record these, so if you miss one, it's no big deal. There's nothing like being live here and being able to go through this. Let's see, we have a question. When should we use PSTs? I'm not sure what PSTs mean. No, I'm not. At the hand, if you can be more specific, what is what do you mean by PSTs? Are you talking about pass-through queries? Okay, pass-through queries. Okay, yeah. When do you use pass-through queries? That's a great point, right? So I know of only one good reason to use pass-through queries. Maybe you guys can come up with other ones. But we keep in mind there's two drawbacks to pass-through queries. Number one, they're read-only. Okay. Read-only part. And number two, they're using the ODBC layer. But for the most part, I use it with reports, right? So if I have a report that's based off a of store procedure, it doesn't have access to a SQL server. I can't associate that report with a start procedure. I can associate with a view because views are considered like table links on access. But when I have a report that's based on a start procedure, and I want when somebody kicks off that report to execute the start procedure, what I'll do it as in code, I'll modify the source of the pass through query, or I'll say exec, exec, SP, whatever the name of the procedure is, I pass the parameters, then I save that pass through query in the S front end. And then I kick off the report. The report then runs the password query, which in turn runs the store procedure, which in turn returns data back from SQL Server. And now I've got a report. So that's the only time I use password queries. Another way you may use password queries is when you want to execute uh, statements. I think about, of course, now I'm doing this, I'm thinking about another reason why. When you want to execute statements. So, for example, if you do select at, at, at server name, so you need the name of the server, for example. You can actually put that. So anything you would type in SQL Server Studio, we're going to see this 
remind me to show you this next month. You can put in a password query. So you can run a whole, um, you know, hundreds of lines of DDL code to modify tables, drop tables, and things, and password queries. Because it's like if you were sitting there and put a magic to doing it there. So there's the two situations I can think of. Yeah, they can be much faster than the glasses queries. Uh, but you're still using the LDBC later, so that's something I want to question. It's not in the LDB. All right. Um, that's what uh, George just mentioned in the comments. I see George here. This is So, yeah, you can use that to excuse All right. Okay. So, any questions? Any other feedback? All right. Hold on a second here. Before we go, I want to do something here. You know, let's stop my recording because. This is the one circle saying so long from Chicago. Welcome back to next month for a single store economy number two. And I will be seeing you next month, I hope. So um, thank you very much. So long from Chicago. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. Glad you enjoyed this. Thank Bye you. Guys. Wendy. Thank you for being here. Metalon, Metalung, Metahan. Thank you. Thank you for that. Merry Christmas.